Hey guys, Missy Kitten here. So, first of all, I apologize for not having last week's video. Um, I ended up getting really sick, so yeah, that was not a fun time. But anyway, we are here and we are back with the Watts family murder. And this is going to be like key parts of Chris's confession. And I say key parts because his confession was extremely long. So I feel that we need to kind of cut it down a bit and just kind of focus on some of the really the most important things that he confessed to. So let's get in on it. So he starts off saying, Shanann got home at like two o'clock. I felt her get into bed. She started rubbing her hand on me and we ended up having sex. When we talked, when I woke up later in the morning, I pretty much told her I didn't think it was gonna work anymore. And she was like, what happened? What was last night? And she just told me, you know, like, to get off of her and she's like I know there was somebody else or I knew there was sorry that there was somebody else I knew there was somebody else I couldn't just say yes there is somebody else but then she just said you're never gonna see your kids again you're never gonna see your kids again get off me don't hurt the baby cuz like when I climbed in, in bed that was pretty much like on top of her, pretty much like straddling her. She thought I was gonna like, you know, hurt her or the baby or something. So, cause she knew that like, you know, something happened. She thought I was trying to check out or something and that's when that happened. So then they, the investigators kind of just started talking about the mistress, um, Nicole, um, Kissinger? Kissinger? Um, I've never actually been sure on how to pronounce her name. So, when I woke her up and I was like, hey, we gotta talk, I just told her I don't feel compatible. I don't feel like this is gonna work. Can we just cancel the trip to Aspen? Because she just booked a trip to go t to a mystery four-star luxury hotel or something. Just me and her. She's got mascara. She didn't wash her face when she got home, so she had makeup on, so mascara is running all over her and stuff like that. Nothing about that conversation. I just wish I could take it all back. The whole Nikki thing back, everything. When I was telling her, like, I told her I didn't love her. I didn't love her anymore. That's when it happened. She told me to get off of her, and I put my hands around her. I felt like she could possibly listen to me laying beside her but I got on top of her. And every time I think about it, I'm just like, did I know I was gonna do that before I got on top of her? I don't know, it's just like, you know, everything that happened that morning, I just don't know. Like, I try to go back in my head. I didn't want to do this, but I did it. Everything just kind of like, it just felt like it was, I don't even want to say, I felt like I had to, I just feel like there was something, there was already something in my mind that was already implanted that I was, that was going to do it, and I woke up that morning, and was going to happen, and I had no control of it. It was just like, like in the sentencing hearing, the prosecutor said it takes two to four minutes for something like that to happen. Like, why couldn't I just let go? I don't even want to know what she saw when she looked back at me, honestly. She wasn't fighting, and the investigators say, why do you think? I don't know, maybe she was just praying, maybe she was just... I read the Bible, it said, you know, like, uh, I read a scripture that said, don't uh, uh, forgive people for they do not know what they do. First of all, I just want to say, he does this very badly. He's just always like, you know, I like, I, uh, and, you know, he just says that a lot and that very much bugs me. 
Even though I know I say that myself, but it seems like he's just trying to like stretch out his confession because it sounds like he's almost like making it up as he goes along. That's how I see it. I need to take a drink because every time I do these videos, I get very bad dry mouth. Mountain Dew, the blood of my family. I wish I was joking, but I am not. Maybe she was saying that, I don't know what she was saying in her head. Like when you guys told me, take off your shirt, check for defensive wounds, like there wasn't going to be any. She didn't fight. I don't know, like, why. Now, I feel like it is very important to mention that Shanann's father said that she had to have been asleep when he did this because there was no doubt in his mind that his daughter would have fought back. I don't know if I wrote that, like, later on, but, yeah, I did not write that, but her father insisted that she had to have been asleep because he knows 100% for a fact that his daughter would have fought for her life. And that's honestly just so heartbreaking. I just... Okay. So the investigators then ask, were her arms pinned down? No, not that I remember. I don't think so. I mean, I don't think, like, I moved to where my knees are around her arms or anything, but I just kind of, like, when I got on top of her, we just started talking, and that was it. It's kind of, like, in my head or the back of my head that was going to happen just at the end of the conversation. It was just, like, that's what happened. I just wish I could let go. It felt like the time, it felt like time was standing still. I lost my place. Okay. Sorry about that. It's kind of like I just saw my life disappearing before my eyes, but I just couldn't let go. It was like somebody else, like, like if you picture somebody else around you holding your hands, holding you to keep you from not letting go. And then they, you know, they asked him, you know, he, he had said something like, you know, was it rage? You know, you had said something about rage. Or kind of something along those lines. And he says that's meaning the rage. The only way to describe it, honestly, like a snap. I guess my attorney had said strangulation is more of like a, I don't know, passionate type thing. I don't know how that can be passionate. And for those of you who don't understand that, um, they say that because you have to sit there and you have to hold the person's throat. You have to look at them as the life is draining from their eyes. And that's why they say strangulation is a more passionate kind of form of murder compared to like a gunshot or a stabbing. You know, it's those are so much quicker compared to strangulation. Fun facts with Missy. Anyway, continuing, I just wanted to explain that in case people did not understand what that meant, because he, Chris Watts himself, didn't understand, so I figured I would kind of explain that a little bit, because I, when I first heard of that myself, I was a bit confused. So... It, understandably, you know, there's a lot of things that can be confusing when they say a crime of passion and things like that. So, continuing now. After, you know, Shanann was like, once that was, once she was gone, it was just like, I didn't know what was going on. It feels like a traumatic event type. Everything, I was shaking I didn't know what had happened. I didn't know what to do. I didn't know what I had done. I still wasn't in that right state of mind. I don't think, like, I wasn't in control of what I 
could think or what I could do in that point in time. Most people say, why didn't you just call 911? Unless you're in that situation, you don't know what you would have done. It's easy to play Monday morning quarterback, which I found that expression very weird. Like, I don't, that could just be me, but I don't, I, that just seemed odd, like a really odd thing to say in my opinion, but hey, it, he is obviously a very odd man that, cause you know, he just went and annihilated his family. But continuing again, I'm sorry, I keep pausing and just saying things. <laughs> Bella came into the room. She walked in. She thought, you know, Shanann was sleeping. I put Shanann in the sheet, carried her downstairs, and backed up my truck. Got everybody in the truck. They, meaning the girls, were sitting in the back in the bench seat. Shanann was on the floor. So his daughters were in the back on the seats while their mother was dead on the floor at their feet. That to me is just horrific. I couldn't even begin to imagine. Like, I get that they were so young, so they wouldn't really process it, but it's sickening to think about. You know, they're just, they're so little, and their mom is dead at their feet. So, the investigators then ask, what did they say? They asked, he says, is mommy okay? I said, she'll be fine. Like, I know my life is completely changed. I don't know what's happening. Like, honestly, I try to picture that whole ride. It's a 45 minute to an hour ride out there, and it's just like, couldn't I have saved my girls' lives? And honestly, that's what gets me the most, is he had that long to change his mind. He had that long to, like he said, to save his girls. And he, he didn't. It just blows my mind. Like, if what he said was true about Shanann saying, you know, you're never going to see your kids again, why would you kill your kids? Then you're really never going to see them again. It, it makes you wonder, you know, the... That's why I'm into all of this stuff. You know, it's the psychological aspect behind these people who commit these horrific acts. So when you get down to the nitty gritty of it, it's... Why? You know, you were told that you're not going to see your kids again, so instead you just go murder them as well as your wife. You're really never going to see them again when you do that. And, you know, it's so hard to wrap your head around. Continuing. Had to say that. Like, that... That got me. Couldn't I have done something? Why did I do that? I don't know. This is my flesh and blood. This is what I wanted all my life, to be a dad. Just to have, you know, kids, and they love me. And... They all... They all that. I, I don't know if I wrote that wrong or if he actually said it that way. I, I probably did write it wrong. So I'm very sorry about that. Then I get a lot of stuff that he said. And nothing makes sense. Like the oil tank, nothing makes sense. I'm just like... What are you doing? I took Shanann out just to place off to the site. Cece was first. She did have a blanket. She had a blue blanket, a Yankee blanket. 
I put the blanket over her head. I didn't want to know. I strangled her right there in the back seat. The investigators then say, and the same for Bella, just without the blanket, with the blanket. I didn't look. I think every, every time I close my eyes, I start to hear her saying, Daddy, no. And that was it. I hear that every day. This is also what really gets me. It shows that it's premeditated. You know, he had this plan all along. You know, he, he was obviously in a right state of mind because he proceeded to do this. The investigators then asked, what were you thinking about when you called the school that day on Monday? He called the school and unenrolled his daughters. That just tells you he was obviously in a proper frame state of mind because he knew to call the school and unenroll his daughter so they wouldn't question why they weren't showing up at school. I... Yeah, I, I don't know what else to say about that. I was freaking out, he said. I was just thinking in my head what I just did, what I had done, and I didn't know it was stupid to do anything, to call the school, to call Anne. Anne was the realtor that they were going through. To call anybody. They were right to be suspicious. Everyone was definitely right to be suspicious about anything because I probably sounded eccentric on the phone and out of sorts and just, you know, I didn't even know what they were thinking when they heard me. Now, the investigators say, can you talk about the trash bags? Do you remember that? There were two. Trying to, because the sheet kept the one coherent thing I guess I had. I didn't want the girls looking at Shanann while they were in the back seat. Put a trash bag on one end of her, one end of her feet and one on her head so they didn't have to see. I just know that when I was driving up there, they were just, you know, sitting there and just kind of asleep or kind of just holding on to each other, laying in each other's laps. I wasn't like dutifully trying to separate anybody, pass them away, or trying to keep anyone separate on the subject of why the girls were in the tanks and Shanann was buried in a shallow grave. Now, the investigators ask, did you ever think about, boy, you know, it could be very believable what I told them. It could be very believable that Shanann did end the girls, and so maybe if I try to convince people that maybe I, I miss words sometimes, I skip words. Maybe if I fought with my attorney on that, maybe I could lessen it somehow. Did you ever think that? Honestly, I never thought about this story until you guys mentioned it. What did you think once it got mentioned? Just like, I just went with it. I knew my dad was out there and I knew they would probably believe it because my mom and my sister just really never liked Shanann. And that is very true. They hated Shanann. They continue to hate Shanann to this day. And I believe that they actually still believe that Shanann killed the girls and that Chris went into a rage and killed Shanann. But I can't say for sure. 
But yeah, I never thought about that story. That's what my attorneys were going with. And then, like, I think it was, like, the second week I told them what actually happened. They were quiet. They were writing it down. They said they wouldn't judge me, so I told them. I told them everything that happened, and they, you know, appreciated it. I guess most of the time, other defendants or their defense don't tell them actually what actually happened. Which, I, I, I believe that. But I also believe that, you know, it's their job to defend. So even if they do tell them what actually happened, they're still going to have to come up with some bull honk story. Just so they can try to, you know, get them off. They just tell them, get me out of here, this is what happened. Which... Again, like I said, you know, I believe that's probably a thing that happens, but also, you know, they, they actually tell what happens, and since it's the defense's job to defend. But I told them what happened. I didn't want them going, if this was going anywhere in courts, I didn't want them to be under a false pretense and get surprised. Because I know there were probably things, like, that, like, you guys probably knew that, I mean, if I lied to them and just told them, no, this is what happened, it would have made them look, you know, foolish and stupid and unprepared. And I'm just like, this is what happened. And they appreciated me telling them that, so now they would be prepared. And that's when they were saying, if we ever went to them, the prosecution, and said we could end this, would I be open to it? I'm like, if this could end, end it. I know there was, no, again, I should say this is the investigators. I know there was like, wasn't her phone on the couch or between the couch cushions? Like, did you plan all that stuff? Chris says, I just threw it in there. I don't know what was going on on that morning. He laughs. He laughs about not knowing what was going on that morning. Even, like, her watch, her phone, if I planned this, I would have probably taken it out to the field with me, you know? They ask, what about her ring and stuff? What were you thinking about that? It's like, you know, maybe she wanted... Maybe she actually really wanted a divorce. Maybe she didn't want to fix it. I just put it there on the counter. They ask, she took it off or did you take it off? I took it off. Now, on the topic of his mistress, some of the conversations on the 14th got a bit weird. I think that's when she met with CBI or something or FBI, I'm not sure who she met with first. The investigators then ask, so she talked with you after she met with... No, she didn't. She told me, like, this is probably the last time you're probably... You'll, you'll probably hear from me. I'm going to stay at my friend Jim's place while this is all going on. A little, 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 little sus, I'm not gonna lie. Just a little bit, but she said not to contact her until this is done. This is where she gets really sus. Let me just tell you, really. She said, she told me I needed to delete everything. I didn't delete everything. I'm not sure why I didn't delete everything. But it probably helped you guys out a little bit. Investigators say she told you to delete everything? Delete all conversations. Did she tell you why? She just said delete it, which I don't think you can ever delete a text message. And so are these people absolutely wrong about Nikki? She wasn't asking you to get rid of your family? No. Are you sure? Yes. I'm sure. She never wanted me to do this. 
was it ever like, I wish you didn't have kids, I want to have kids of my own with you? She never knew if she wanted to have kids, but she said that, you know, at one point she said, I'd like to give you a son. Well, did she know Shanann was pregnant with a boy? No. And why is that? You just didn't tell her? I didn't tell her. Because, like, we had met. But this is a very important part. But Shanann put that on Facebook. Like, how did she not see that? The investigator says. I don't know, is Chris's response. And it is very important to know that forensic analysis of Nikki's phone showed that she had viewed Shanann's Facebook page. So it is extremely like likely that Nikki knew that Shanann was pregnant. She had searched Shanann multiple times. Now, a lot of people think, this is again the investigators, a lot of people think that you named Nico after Nikki. So, what was that all about? Because people are like, I feel like I should kind of delve into this more. Her name is Nicole Lee, and they were going to name the son Nico Lee. And Chris says, you know, Lee is my middle name. Lee is his dad's middle name. So people are, I understand where people are coming from, you know, kind of being a little suspicious about that because um, I myself have always been a little suspicious about that. But continuing. Nico was actually a name that Shanann liked, he says. I actually wanted to spell it like N-E-K-O. I thought it was like Neko that way, but she said Nico. I thought it, she said N-I-C-O, my bad. I thought it said Nico or something. I guess Nico is more of like an Italian name and to like leave her middle, leave her my middle name and my dad's and all of that. But Nico, that's a name that she always liked. So that is the end of his confession that he actually gave the, the police. He would later go on to write a letter stating how he first smothered Bella and Cece with their pillows. Then he killed Shanann. Only for the girls to wake up. And then obviously he drove them out to the site where he strangled them with, or, you know, suffocated them with the blankets. Um, he said that Little Bella, after seeing what had happened to Cece, said, Daddy, please do not do to me what you did to Cece. Not only that, but the medical examiners found that Bella had bitten her tongue, indicating that she put up a fight. And when he talked about that, he almost said it so proudly, like Bella was always a little fighter. Which, to me, that's, almost, that's really sickening. That he was, like, proud that his daughter fought for her life against him. But. And. This case is very similar to the Lacey Peterson case. Which we will probably talk about someday. But, as of right now, our next case, since I have already got it done and all set up probably going to record it right after I finish with this one, is going to be the murder of Larry King. If you guys do not know that one, 
you're gonna. And if you're like me, it was it is extremely heartbreaking. But it is important to know, let me just say this. If you are not happy in your relationship, leave. Do not murder your partner or your children. Do not become a family annihilator. Please and thank you. I shouldn't have to say that, but please and thank you for, you know, anyone who leaves and doesn't annihilate their family. I believe statistics show that most family annihilators are men and that most family annihilators end up committing suicide after annihilating their family. But obviously, sadly, in this case, he did not. So he is now going to rot in prison for the rest of his life, which, you know, I mean, that's fair. Hopefully, you know, he's reminded every day of his beautiful wife and children that he took the lives of. And, yeah, he's not allowed to have pictures of them in his cell anymore, which is a good thing, because he doesn't deserve to see them. You know, he, he took their lives. I mean, it would be nice because, you know, it's a reminder of what he did but at the same time, he shouldn't be allowed to see. I, that's just my opinion on that. But that'll be it for this video. Um, thank you all so much for watching. And again, sorry for the delay on this. But I will see you guys next time for the murder of Larry King. That was a weird ending, but... <laughs>